Merry Christmas, everyone. Welcome. I'm so glad you all are here today. Let's all stand and worship together. pleasure it is to be in fellowship with you on this Christmas day, the fifth and final week of Advent. Today we celebrate the birth of our Savior and Messiah, Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 2 verses 8 through 14. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled, filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Over the past five weeks, we have talked about hope, peace, joy, and love, and the importance that each of these virtues play in our spiritual lives. Today is accumulation of those virtues, given as a gift to each of us, Peace this Christmas, filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit 
and are able to spread the love of Christ's salvation. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Tears are falling, hearts are breaking, how we need to hear from God. You've been promised, we've been waiting, welcome holy child, welcome holy child. Hope that you don't mind our manger how i wish i would have known but long awaited holy stranger make yourself at home please make yourself at to our violence bid our hungry souls be filled word now breaking heaven's silence welcome to our world welcome to Continue to worship. Everybody stand. Joyful, all ye 
Christmas. I'm glad some of you wore something besides red. <laughs> and I can't see John because so many lights around his head that, you know, you just, just this glare and glow. All right. Well, we're glad to have you here and uh, glad to worship the Lord together as we look at Matthew chapter one, the passage for Christmas today. Verses 18 to 25, and stand together as we honor the word of the Lord. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ is as follows. This is according to Matthew. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded, was minded to put her away secretly. While Joseph thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he 
will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken to the Lord, or by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for Jesus. So we recognize we need Jesus today. And uh, bless us as we focus in on this Christmas time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe may be seated. So as we are transitioning from Advent to the Nativity story, we light the Christ candle, and it's lit. It's just barely, it's not above the, <laughs> to where you can see, I can see it. It, it is lit. Uh, probably should have carved down the sides a little bit. My fault. Something else I did wrong this week. And <laughs> anyway, Jesus has come, and Christians everywhere celebrate his arrival. Now, I don't know about you, but my dad would read the Christmas story before we unwrapped the presents, after we'd had breakfast, and after I would got up at 5 a.m. and gazed at the tree for half an hour, and then another hour, and then another hour, and another hour, and then finally mom and dad would drag themselves out, and then she would cook breakfast. We had to have the routine, you know. Uh. But we were allowed to get into our stockings. Well, pff, that was 5.30. But anyway, we sat there and anticipated and anticipated, and then he got out the Bible. Luke chapter 2, right? Read the whole story. And then he didn't stop there because he went to Matthew chapter 2 and had to read about the wise men. <sighs> It's okay, but for a kid, you know. And this Sunday, we've really ruined it because this Sunday is Christmas Sunday, so now we have to wait till after church. For those of you that had to wait. But there's another gospel, which is Matthew's. Luke's gospel, we anticipate shepherds in the field keeping watch over their flock, and an innkeeper with a stable full of soft, sweet-smelling hay, and, and pregnant Mary then comes to the, the stable, and there's no room in the inn, and so she has to deliver her baby out there, and, and uh, all of this with angels singing and shepherds coming, and it's the wonder and the beauty and the nostalgic simplicity of it that just grasps us. The animals are keeping the stable warm, you know, with their heat. And so most of our nativity scenes are clean and quiet, worshipful faces, resting animals, a clean stable. I mean, it's a perfect environment. Even the song Away in the Manger, they didn't sing it yet this morning, and they probably will, says that Jesus never cries. I mean, it's like, wow, man. I mean, it's a perfect setup. I mean, you can't get more sanitary than that. Our idealism about this story often sanitizes it, removing the messy reality of it, and and then you get to think, what about the pain of delivery? I was there three times. What about, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> the placenta, the umbilical cord. There's, there's stuff here. I mean, this is not, mm. anyway, the lack of a delivery room. There's no doctor. There's, there's noise, there's filthiness of a barn filled with an... No one I know today delivers a baby and sticks it in a manger. Nobody. You know anybody? I mean, I don't know. Maybe in some far off... I don't know. 
But I, and besides this stable scene, we also tend to sanitize the family dynamics around Joseph and Mary. Matthew's account is not Luke's account. He doesn't tell us about the shepherds. He doesn't tell us about the, the angels singing, the sweet-smelling hay, and all this stuff. Uh, he doesn't say sweet in Luke's story, but it's not a sanitized narrative at all. In fact, Matthew plunges us right into messy family dynamics that Jesus is born into. A betrothed virgin ends up pregnant. And the man she's engaged to found out. This was a real mess in a culture with a religion that said it's okay to stone a woman who's caught in adultery. This was a difficult place for Joseph to be in. He had love and compassion for Mary, but he also had a righteous reputation. He had a business. He had a dedication to his religious faith to honor. Divorce was on his mind. That's what he was going to do. And so in this mess on this Christmas day, we reflect on God's love. How does it all tie together? Maybe despite our nostalgic feelings toward the shepherds and angels and so on in Luke 2, this is a perfect passage for us to talk about the love of God because God's love was so great that he not only entered this world in a stable, but also he entered into humanness with all of its mess. So while we can sanitize perhaps in our minds being born in a barn, and think it's all so cute. We can't sanitize the fact that he was in a mess. Are you in a mess? You been in a mess? I just, I can't get over the fact that Mary births a baby and then in all of our manger scenes, she's standing there worshiping the baby a couple hours later. All dressed, looking nice, hair combed, everything's perfect. It ain't that way in real life. Life is a mess. Jesus was born into that. Well, let's just look at his his uh, royal lineage of David. That's, he was born into this, you know, Gospel of Matthew open, chapter 1, we didn't read it, with the ancestry of Jesus, about which there are many things to know, and one of them is this mess in his genealogy. Matthew's genealogy mentions four women by name and another by, uh, well, it mentions her husband. And he's alluded to, and Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and it says Uriah's wife, which we know is Bathsheba. And Mary is the fifth one. So we have these five ladies. Of these women, the first was involved in an incest scandal. The second was a prostitute. The third was a Moabite, which the Jewish people considered about as bad as being a prostitute. And the fourth was trapped in a messy situation of rape and adultery, which led to even murder of her husband by King David. And the fifth turned out pregnant before she was married. That's a messy genealogy or ancestry for a Jew, especially for the Son of God, the promised Messiah. He should have had a perfect lineage, right? Jo Joseph and Mary are both listed in this genealogy. Naming Mary as Jesus' mother emphasizes the virgin birth because she actually gave birth. Uh, but Joseph, her husband, as his father connects Jesus to the royal line of David. This was important because it indicated that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah 23, 5, that the Messiah would be a descendant of David. For Joseph to be named as Jesus' father is incredibly important. Adoption in ancient Jewish culture worked differently than it does now. Adoption 
uh, if a man claimed this child as his, he was considered in everyone's eyes to be that child's father, regardless of who the biological parent was. In legal and relational terms, as well as in matters relating to the inheritance, for Joseph to claim Jesus as his child ended all question and all debate. This was his child, as far as everybody's concerned. So for Joseph to appear in the genealogy as the father of Jesus before Matthew even told about Jesus' birth offers an important foreshadowing clue for first-time readers that despite the drama surrounding Mary's premarital pregnancy, we now know that Joseph was going to claim Jesus as his child in the genealogies. This put Jesus into the royal lineage of David. We got that lineage down, but then I say Jesus is born into a mess. Betrothals, or betrothals in, the, in the first century were not like engagements today. Betrothal was a contract between two families. It's not like, let's plan to get married. No, it was, our marriage has begun. We just don't live together. Money and goods were exchanged in this stage, and it, it was a binding commitment. Betrothals were difficult to call off. Since it was this contract, the part of the whole marriage experience, ending the relationship required writing a divorce out, going before the powers to be and saying, we're breaking a contract. And when you did that, it often left the woman destitute, dependent on her parents, or other family members for survival. I think of the story of Ruth and so on. And while betrothed, the wife did not live with her husband until the marriage was completed. They were both expected to behave with the same fidelity, faithfulness of a married couple. They were to be only for each other. And often the betrothal was the period of time that the husband would actually be building a house for his wife and family and looking for, as he, as he would lay every... He would spackle the wall. Whatever he was doing, everything was all about, this is my future. Our future. Getting things ready for his family, his wife to move in. Everything that he hoped for. As he worked on that. I imagine sometimes she would stop by. How's it going, Joseph? Well, this is where our bedroom, this is where the kids are going to, this is where kitchen, what do you, you have any ideas about the kitchen? I'd like more cupboards. Can you imagine what he's been going through? So unfaithfulness in a betrothal would not only, was reason to call off an engagement, but it was grounds to call for a stoning. Women who were calling adultery were taken outside of town and stoned to death because they didn't want the town name to be besmirched by anything. They didn't want sinful dead bodies to take and make the town unclean. Mary would have been viewed as the entire community as being unfaithful. They would have had no reason not to think so. Her neighbors had to frame this in their minds. They had no other way to, to think this through. To believe in or understand that there was a Holy Spirit involvement in this. I mean, think about it. Uh, even other women who had become miraculously impregnant, I mean, they were Sarah, Hannah, Mary's cousin Elizabeth. I mean, these women who were miraculously pregnant were done, the pregnancy was done by their own husbands, even though it was way late in their life. And it was a miracle. So there's no frame of reference where a woman gets pregnant by God. We're not even sure how Joseph found out about her pregnancy. 
She might have told him or he might have heard rumors and confronted her about it. However he found out, we can be confident that his initial thoughts were that she had committed adultery with another man. He knew it wasn't him. He's working on their house. He's dreaming these dreams, as she was too. But this is from his standpoint. And now, she's committed adultery. You can imagine, I, I can't hardly, the devastation this would have caused him. Well, he's preparing their, he's anticipating their home. The future, the everything, the dreams are crumbling around him. See, the righteousness of, of Joseph is important in this story. I mean, he's got a community, he's got a business, he's got a name, and everybody's going to assume. And so he's going to have to do something. So he decided to divorce her. But that's not super really what matters in his culture and religion. He had every right to divorce her for bringing shame on him and his family. But what matters is he decided to do it secretly. He could have called for her stoning, humiliating her in front of the entire community, but divorcing her quietly was a compassionate choice because he was a righteous man. He cared. He loved her. You have heard some of these details before, but the point is being made is that Jesus is born into a mess. So what did God do? God entered the mess. The angel of the Lord arrived to explain to Joseph that Mary wasn't unfaithful, that hers was a child conceived of the Holy Spirit, in verse 20. Now, we have seen angel messengers throughout the story of Jesus' birth. I mean, Luke is big on angel messengers. <laughs> I mean, they appear to Joseph to, here, but they've already appeared to Mary and, and to Zechariah and, and to the shepherds and they're announcing God's coming to the world, and they declared the day of the Lord that the prophets talked about is going to happen. It's happening right now. Everybody excited and happy and singing and great and all. Oh, wow. Matthew's account lets us know that this changed. Joseph took the message of the angel, and then he married Mary, and he named Jesus, Jesus, as he was told to by the angel. This indicated his receptivity and obedience to the message from the angel, which was really a message from God. Joseph trusted God in a significant and life-altering way. He walked forward into this mess and became a willing participant in the mess. With his obedience, Joseph was entrusting his and his entire family's reputation to God. Joseph's faith in God was bigger than his fear of the community. See, this incarnation is about God entering into humanity's messes. Jesus entered this world born of ordinary human beings with ordinary human struggles. This was not a pristine family without issues, even though we often paint him that way. We tend to want to focus on their faithfulness and ignore their humanity. These feelings. The hurt. The gossip. The reputation. Even though they were faithful, their path was not easy. And their life was not free of burdens, of salacious gossip, of messes. Joseph found out the truth about Mary thanks to an angel, but 
Do you think the angel went and appeared to all the neighbors? Showed up at the well where they're all gossiping about Mary and Joseph. And he's, oh, wait a minute. The child Mary is carrying was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Stop your gossiping. And it doesn't say that the angel appeared to them. Yeah, like they would have believed it anyway. I don't know. And then Joseph decides to marry her anyway. For all we know, people assumed then that he was admitting that he was the father of the child. That he couldn't wait. He had broken the marriage contract. By sleeping with her before it was official a marriage. The hindsight of history allows us to see this couple as faithful because we know the big picture. We know how the story turned out. We take a, excerpts from here and there and we read over and oh, it's a beautiful little thing. But their life was difficult and awkward. All the months, I think, when Mary started to show and the gossip began, until they fled to go to Bethlehem to have the baby born because of the census, I think all of those months were awkward. I think they were messy. I think they were the talk of the town. You don't hear any news going around Brazil about people, do you? Nazareth was a small town. Everybody knew. I wonder when sometimes she'd walk, if some of them would turn their back on them. So I say maybe it was just as well that Jesus was born far from Nazareth. Maybe it worked out for good that after they spent two years in Bethlehem until the, the wise men arrived. And then they were warned and they went to Egypt for another few years. And I don't know how long, but when they finally made it back to Nazareth, maybe this was all how God, God planned it all. Because by the time they get back to Nazareth, years later, they have other children. The gossips have moved on to something else. <laughs> it's no longer, you know, their family. And they get welcomed back into the city of Nazareth and begin to raise their many children there in a community where what happened so long ago is mostly forgotten. So my friends, the incarnation is not just about Jesus being born in a stable instead of a palace. It is also about the proximity and experience of God where he experienced us when he physically moved into the messiness of our world. Not just the stable. That was the least of it. But humanity with all of its stuff. personal relationships. Jesus took on humanity with all its fullness from day one, including family dynamics and gossipy community members. I'm just so glad he wasn't born in Nazareth. But instead was born in Bethlehem. So I was reflecting My personal family history has some messes, quite a few. Your family probably has a few bad sheep. Bah, bah. But you cover it up really good. You look real good on Sunday morning. I'm sure you've never done anything messy in your life. 
we're good Christians. But I can tell you, I don't have the right to stand out as a pristine example of a perfect household. And probably you don't either. We've got the pedigree, we have the lineage of David, we've, everything's gone perfect in our lives. Some of us may pretend or whitewash our family trees. or our family histories, or our own personal history. Thinking about it, Jesus whitewashed the messiness of our histories, didn't he? He said, I forgive you of a whole lot of messiness. point is we all have issues we've all have problems we all have sins we all have less than perfect stories but God through a cross enters our messes Lord if you will you can make me clean he says I will be thou clean Thank you, Jesus. The love of God does not run from our humanity. He came into humanity. The love of God doesn't shut off when he sees our messes. He flows into our messes. And he transforms them into something better. Because what I found out is when I have a history of mess, that God can use that history to say, I helped you from this. I can help somebody else through this. Thank the Lord. He redeems our messages and our messes and makes them into a message of redemption for someone else. We can share our story. Look what God did. Look what God has done. Say, I used to be like that, but Jesus came in. We can have confidence that if God willingly entered a complicated family dynamic in the incarnation, then our situations aren't too much for God. I mean, he could have chosen other families without this. Tells me there is no distance that God wouldn't travel to illustrate his love for humanity, for you, for me. God loves you. Merry Christmas, God loves you. Even in your imperfect history, he loves you. Even in your imperfect life, he loves you. He died to offer you the opportunity to surrender your messes. You can take the mess and say, here it is. And God says, I'll take care of that. And he removes it as far from us as the east is from the west. Wow. God loves to step into your life, my life, Turn our messes into a story of redemption, a story of change, a story of how God made B.C. into A.D., how God made the difference before Christ, and now I'm a Christian. There is a line of an old hymn that says, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star, reaches to the lowest hell. This Advent narrative, the story of hope and anticipation, is ultimately bathed in the love of God. We trust God because God loves us. Like Joseph, we just have to trust him. 
The story of Christmas, the story of the incarnation, is one that doesn't run from conflict or pain or humanness or messiness. Jesus' birth embraces all the messes of humanity. God came to earth because of his love in spite of the mess. And we are loved no matter who we're married to and all of their stuff, their mess. Because I know your family was pristine, but you had to marry into that family. And she's saying the same thing about me. Right? Because you marry stuff, years of stuff. Whether that mess is of our own making or someone else's, Maybe it's even a mess that has been created because we are seeking to be faithful to God and our faithfulness to God calls us to have to say to some people, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Just being a Christian causes some messes in today's society. And the people around us just don't see the full picture. They don't understand why God is more important. Why on Christmas Sunday morning you choose to be here? But God is present with us in the midst of it all. He's present. He loves. So on this Christmas Sunday, we look ahead in the knowledge that we are loved. We have hope in the face of uncertainty because we are loved. By God, through Jesus. And no matter where we are, no matter what lies ahead, this is the heart of the Christmas message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son into our mess. He sent his son into our messes that we might have a real relationship with God. So, Lord, we just bow. on this Christmas Sunday and say thank you. I was preparing this message. I just reflected on some of the messes in my world and in my life. And the messes in some of the people that I minister to. And the messes Grandma's prayers being unanswered, salvation of the lost. Life is full of messes, Lord. Brokenhearted parents. Maybe this is the first Christmas without a loved one. Our world is messy. And Jesus, you love us. You came in spite of the mess. You gave in spite of the mess. And for that person watching online right now, Some are homesick. Some are struggling through this holiday season, isolated or quarantined. I remember Thanksgiving a year ago when we had to do it. Lord, would you enter into our messes? Would you remind us once again of the hope, peace, joy, and love? 
not the sanitized version, but help us to see the messy version. Not nostalgia, but reality. And the reality is there's a God who loves us in spite of all the garbage of this world. He still loves me. He still loves you. And so, thank you, Lord. Thank you today. We bow our heads, Lord, and say thank you. We worship you. We bring our messes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As they sing, I just want to give us an opportunity to talk to Jesus. Whatever it is that's on your heart this Christmas morning, what a great day to release some of that to the Lord. I don't think you'll forget it. On Christmas Sunday, I gave my family, I gave my issues, I gave my problems to the Lord. As we stand together and they sing, just give yourself some time to pray and talk to the Lord about it before we close this service. Lord, speak peace to our hearts today. Calm our minds in the busyness, the sacredness of a day commemorating your birth. We realize, Lord, that we're humans. And your gift was not to make us less human, but your gift was to make us more spiritual in the middle of our humanity can we become more like Jesus and Lord I pray that you'll take my emotions and Lord take our low self esteem and take our Lord sense of failures and take Lord our sense of can't do it and fill us with grace Take our sense, Lord, of family members who won't talk to us or family members who, I don't know what all the people are dealing with, those that are 
quarantined, those that are, Lord, hurting today, those that have chosen not to be with family for Christmas. All of these things that are going on that we read about and just those people who are at war today, those people who, Lord, have no home today. They're in a shelter somewhere. Lord, we have a world that's just full of mess. But God, if we could just see Jesus. Lord, help us to see Jesus. Help us to see you. Help me as a pastor to see you. Help us to get rest. Help us, Lord, to get away. Help us, Lord, to to focus in. And help us to remember that as bad as maybe our situation is, it's not as bad as someone else's. And help us to be grateful that we have family that loves us. Help us to be grateful, Lord, that there is a God who died for us. And help us to put Christ back into the mess of Christmas. And help us, Lord, now to focus our lives surrounding Jesus. And less, Lord, about me and the things that I wish could be taking place the problems that could be solved what I cannot do I have to put in your hands and allow God to do it be with those in the nursing homes be with those that are quarant- be with all of this Lord be with those that are running scared hiding the ones that are fragile, the ones that are hurting, the one who's spending Christmas alone. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for loving us. I'll be in our worship together today and help us as we leave to celebrate Christmas. Keep people safe on the roads. Thank you for protecting us from the storm. And Lord, we just love you. In Jesus' name. Let's worship.
Glad to see you all here today, and I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas. We're going to do our last song now. No, nope. you're not on that order. <laughs> it's not Laurie's fault. It says announcements, and I didn't get the word to her quick enough. <laughs> I was just thinking, Pastor talked to us this morning about messes. Have you got kids? Have you got grandkids? Have you got great-grandkids? We know about messes occasionally, don't we? <laughs> when they're little, those messes we clean up, and when they get bigger, sometimes they get sick or they have problems, and you pray a lot. We do pray a lot and trust God to get us through it. God sent Jesus to into our messes, and about a little over eight years ago, God sent us a pastor and his wife to enter into our messes and to support us when we need them. And we need to remember that they're just as human as we are. You, did you ever think about that? <laughs> they sometimes have messes too. And, and uh, who, do, who does the pastor go to when he has a mess? <laughs> you know? So we appreciate and love them so much for the fact that they, they are here, they're ours, aren't they? They belong to us. And we appreciate them so much. We're going to give them a little Christmas gift this morning. And Jana... Okay, Jana, bless her heart, she's here today. Brad, would you escort your bride up here, please? <laughs> Pastor, would you escort your bride up here? <laughs> Our son-in-law and daughter, daughter are here today, and he calls her his bride, even though they've been married nine years. So, <laughs> We're grateful at Christmas, but we're grateful all the time for what you mean to us and what you do for us, Jana. If I had to clean this church, I'm telling you what, it'd be a long time getting it done. And she faithfully takes care of it and keeps us in order and keeps us clean, dust-free, lint-free, whatever you do with all the cleaning that's, that's responsible for her. So thank you so much to all of you. This is for our Jana. <laughs> Brad, we're glad you're here today, too. And we appreciate you supporting your wife and what she does for us. And there's for our Debbie and our pastor. And we just want to thank them today, Christmas Day, right here in our church, together as we are. We are grateful that we have you. Always will be. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. I, I did want to say one other thing, and I, I left me. There was a, I read about a pastor, and maybe you did too, that um, said he would go down every morning when the train came through town and stand and watch that train go by. He said it was the only thing he didn't have to push. So <laughs> I have thought how our pastor is so responsible. The buck has to stop with somebody, you know, So and it usually stops with him. Unfortunately, sometimes that happens. But just encourage our pastor and his wife. Every chance you get, not just in Christmas, but all year long. Thank you. Christmas, everybody, and we'll see you next week.